Let's go and get started for today. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for like a, this highly experimental pilot of what will hopefully be a course that we'll offer next year. Um, we're trying to basically just put, keep on pushing the whole notion of BIM and how BIM tools get used to really the next logical step, I think, in the process. You know, in the sequence of classes, you know, we started with basic building modeling and how to create different types of elements to sort of express uh, design visions uh, in a very kind of architectural sense primarily. And then in building systems integration got into how to bring all the different pieces together to try and be a more of a holistic coordinated building that involves all the different things, the structure, the mechanical, electrical. In C, it's been more of an exploration of uh, just really how programming languages and automation can start to help us rapidly explore a lot of options to try and evaluate and ultimately kind of figure out what's most optimal. But the course that's always sort of been missing that I wanted to do is really this one, which is the, now that you have all the information in a model that the designers contributed to, how can we then go ahead and use that information to just plan the logistics and the coordination and just the sequence of operations that are gonna happen on site? You know, not only at the beginning of the process, but to kind of keep updating it continually through the whole life. Because I think what a lot of you are finding out, you know, in the job site, in the trailers, is that you sort of end up living in these coordination meetings where like all the information that's theoretically in that model and well coordinated, you're kind of constantly renegotiating and changing and kind of working with it, stuff like that. So an awful lot is happening there in terms of how the building industry is really being reoriented. So the idea is to really explore a whole series of tools and what they're bringing into the picture so you kind of try to really get towards which tools are best for which pieces in the equation. Yeah, that's what it's really kind of all about. And, really what's enabling us to do. In terms of what we're doing here, the idea is to really kind of run a pilot just with a small group and kind of see in a very experimental way, how's this kind of working? Like what sort of takes off? Work together to figure out what the projects could look like. It's all just very experimental at this point. So, you know, even more so than any other courses, like please be really interactive and jump in and it's more like a workshop. It's not really a lecture in terms of what's going on. Um, in terms of logistics, you know, let's just kind of agree on times and things like that. The idea is to go ahead and do it live here. And you know, tell me, based on your experience now, a little bit with the uh, internship, like, you know, what, what's a good starting time for you? Oh, no, we can definitely do five. Five is generally good. Yeah. Okay, and it's five good for you, Ron? Okay, so then we'll, we'll leave it at that, kind of, then yeah, if you're running late, no worries, just text and stuff like that, that works perfect. And hanging out here, the idea is to do it live here. What we'll do is for, uh, we'll see if Nicholas is gonna join us. I think he may be joining us eventually online. And even if people can't come on any particular day, the idea is what I'd like to do is just kind of put it into Google Hangout so that if you want to just join online, you can. It'll sort of show up on the bottom of the screen and that you can still interact just the same as though you're here. It's, you know, it's kind of trying to make it easy. On the async side, again, I'll post all this stuff to uh, like uh, YouTube, so and you know, there'll be kind of a list of all those different things on the Ventopia side, but you know, kind of consume it whatever you can. Because the nature of it is, and it will continue to be true, for the summer, you know, a lot of things will go on that will pull you in different directions, and there'll be times you can't make it. And that's okay. You know, it's just really, I just appreciate the time that you are here. And you know, it's, it's, it's all just good helpful feedback that will really help shape how this course is gonna stay, shake out. Okay, oh, in terms of units and stuff like that, like, you, know, you guys aren't registered right now. Okay, so, and that's fine. So go ahead, we'll, we'll talk about how to sort of get credit for what you're doing here during the school year. Okay, that's all. Yeah, and we'll kind of just figure out as you dive through it, like, you know, how much time you're putting in and all that kind of stuff. But the idea is to really, you know, make that available, like when you, when you, when you have the option of uh, using it. <laughs> okay, at a high level, here's basically what we're gonna be talking about. It really is this whole, kind of path that starts with just how we get information together from a lot of different sources and integrated, coordinated, and ultimately get it all um, just registered with each other so that it's, you're accurately understanding how things are overlapping or not. And that's really what we're going to talk about today is a lot of just really model integration from a lot of different disciplines and sources and how you translate it to you. Yeah, you're going to get into the whole notion of searching, isolating, and highlighting things, and hopefully we'll talk about that some today. But as we kind of move on through, we're going to get into just the whole notion of, you know, 
could we be adding information to the building model, just the database of information to support the downstream uses? So if we start thinking about trying to use this information for estimating or for construction scheduling, how we can actually start adding information into the model, or even just information about that's extending the data in there, you know, the sources of some of the parts that we're talking about, uh, the cost information, sections of a specification that it's related to. But the idea really is so much of the building information modeling is that if you're creating a big 3D database and everything's kind of hanging around in there, can you use those elements, even if you're not viewing them spatially, just as the master database to coordinate everything that ultimately exists on the site? Something like that. So we'll kind of keep on thinking about how we can extend the model we need to, to kind of encode it properly. Uh, we'll talk about how we find crashes and interferences, which is a very common application, and there's three or four different applications for doing that. And think about the pluses and minuses and differences in some of those different approaches. That's what the whole the invitation to BIM 360 was about, because we have Navisworks on these machines, we have BIM 360, which is sort of a very, very much like a web-based version of a lot of the Navisworks functionality. But there's other tools you know, that are very, very good for doing that. We're going to explore too, like Building Explorer, yeah, I think we're more in terms of forward, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, model-based uh, estimating, the idea being we would like to be able to estimate, at least accurately quantify what's in the models. And we talked about this last time a little bit as we were prepping that, you know, just having accurate quantities, it removes one source of variability. You still have the whole issue of how you price things and all the strategic things you do as part of preparing the estimate. But if nothing else, if you can at least take the drudgery out of getting accurate quantities and somewhat automate that process so that if a new model comes your way, you're sure to find the differences as opposed to having to go hunting for them. You know, that can really just greatly at least improve you know, the accuracy of what you're estimating on. Yeah. The sad part is a lot of bids are won just based on the fact that people leave things out of them. And you know, where that sort of works out competitively okay in some senses, it's, it's not a great way Kind of do it. So we're trying to see if we can actually use the models to increase the accuracy. And then get all the time-based simulation stuff. And there's a lot of things going on there. A high level doing these 4D simulations, which I think you know, we've played around with a little bit, you know, uh, which are great for making these very whizzy presentation views that everyone goes ooh and all that. But maybe they're not as useful as what we need as really going through and doing some very detailed thinking about crews and locations and where they are and how they're sequenced through the project in an efficient way, kind of at a more micro level. You know, so it's, it's really around thinking in a deeper level. So it's really just kind of exploring how the models can support all this stuff. Which, but, but again, yeah, since you guys are actually like in the field right now, you should also, uh, as we go, you know, think about you know, topics that you're seeing and just issues that are coming up. And yeah, anything that sounds interesting, let's try and address it and see if we can uh, come up with something and yeah, that might actually be a great topic to be thinking about here. Okay, tools-wise, yeah, you know, Navisworks. Some of the Autodesk tools are easy to work with. I mean, I'm, I'm in many cases, sort of industry standards. So working with Navisworks is kind of a natural. M three sixty B, oh, kind of the web-based counterpart to it. But some of the other tools I want to be sure to explore are there's Vico, which is kind of very good in some ways. There's Building Explorer, okay, which is a meta tool that I think is actually very good and very powerful in what it does. You guys have experience in working with I2, and some of its pluses and minuses, and which is actually kind of put it on the list in terms of thinking about you know, where that fits in. But we'll think about really how we want to spend our time together. Synchro you brought up today. Synchro was something we actually looked at a little while ago. I2 is written with others. I2? Yep. I2 W. I mean, the I is the same. TWO? Like that? Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. So, yeah. Close. So, we'll go ahead and really be exploring different tools along the way. The, the idea, though, is to really be less about the tools, understand the tools, but be about those issues and you know, try to focus on models and kind of explore you know, how the tools either support or don't support those. Because those same issues, bringing the model in, integrating it, registering it, finding things, being able to search the model, and then ultimately kind of use it to support what we're trying to do the analysis of. And that's common across all the different tools. So 
Today, what I wanted to do more than anything is really just kind of explore this issue of creating the integrated project model and look at a couple different examples of that, of various degrees of complexity. And that's what's on that data, those data sets that we gave to you. There are everything from kind of models that are relatively simple or that you're familiar with. Um, there's some simple ones like the, like the little multi-story uh, kind of retail and like uh, office building that they used in A is kind of in there, but also the Audubon Center from the B class is in there, which has a little more complexity. And there's one model in there that's just incredibly complex. It's the uh, Riverside Hospital, which I thought would be appealing since uh, it has a lot of the complexity that you guys are familiar with. But the idea is in those data sets, we have both the Revit data sets and often a lot of Navisworks files that have come out of the Revit file. And that's really what I want to start with, is just that whole notion of given that we have a building information model, uh, typically in Revit, but it could be in other structures, how do we get it all together? And then after we figure out how to get it all together, how do we go ahead and explore it and save the viewpoints and things like that? So just as a way of overview in terms of what we should want to do, it's kind of like this. You know, we're going to go through a basic three-step process, exporting the uh, Revit models in the NWC files, at least in terms of taking them to Navisworks, creating the Navisworks project and appending them, which pull them all together, and kind of adjusting them if we need to, to kind of get them in coordination and uh, get them all so they're on the same coordinate system. And finally, saving that and there's really two different native data source formats, and there's pluses and minuses of using each of us, and to kind of really understand that stuff. So that's the beginning of all this. So as a starting point, it really goes with just exporting these Revit models. And we'll go ahead and get started. So like, if you want to open up Revit, please do. And if you do open up Revit, let's see if I can get Revit open over here. My little BIM 360 action happening back there. Oh, let's start with just making sure that Revit is set up the way we want it to be. Because in terms of uh, being able to kind of get these models to hang out and uh, transfer between the different systems, the different kind of software tools, there's a couple things that are important. If we're trying to get them to go to Navisworks, the big thing is Navisworks is typically has to be on the machine that you're working with. And when Navisworks gets installed, it actually installs a special little plugin to Revit that actually helps us export them. So let's start over here. So you might check just in your toolbar or just on the desktop to see if Navisworks is there. It kind of looks like a funny little green N. Navisworks Manage is probably hanging out there because I think we installed it on in all these machines. The yeah, see if you can see it out there. You write that Navisworks in search, would it come up? It might, but yeah. I don't know. Okay. Is it Navisworks Management or? Navisworks Free Manage, Manage. yes. There's, there's two versions. Navisworks Manage has all the features and capabilities. Navisworks Freedom is, it's almost like kind of come out here. It's a smaller subset okay. of like the functionality. Okay, so it looks like it's there. That part's good. You got Navisworks on yours? Excellent. So if Navisworks is there, I'm guessing that the tool for doing the file exports is there too. In terms of working with Navisworks, Navisworks actually has a feature built right into it that nominally is supposed to be able to import Revit files. What it does in the background, though, is it actually does just a little back-end programming to open up Revit and do some, you know, it, it does the, basically the transfer without opening up Revit. But what I find is that it's not always the most accurate way to do it. So even for some of the global ADC people who are working with Renate, we found that if they just opened Navisworks and then said open the Revit file, you didn't always get all the parts. Like sometimes parts were missing. So we'll show you how to do that, but I'm going to advocate actually starting over in the Revit file and from there, like uh, sending it out. So if you want to sort of play around, well, how about this? I'm going to open up Navisworks first. We'll sort of see what the destination is and then we'll go from there. So I'll open up Navisworks on my side. I think I'm opening on my side. There it goes. 
I'll kind of bring some in, and then we'll sort of export them again and kind of uh, take them back out again. So this is Navisworks. Navisworks is really, at some level, it's this giant Swiss army knife of interesting tools for helping you work with building models. Um, the big features in here is just this whole notion of being able to kind of integrate and search and find elements. But there's also some very specific tools that people tend to work with. The biggie is being Clash Detective for finding interferences and like uh, trying to coordinate those. Timeliner for doing 4D simulation or even this quantification tool for pulling out kind of quantities. But I'm going to go ahead and close those tools right now and just go ahead and turn on this thing called the selection tree. You'll see there's nothing hanging out in the tree right now because we haven't loaded anything yet. But if we go through and we start appending files, we can append a whole series of different files to bring a project together. And the way it tends to work is that when you say append, you can go out and choose the files that you want to get. If you're going towards those uh, files that we sort of put in the folder for today, let me see if I can actually, uh, I got Stanford, D. The entire folder or? Actually, now we're going to take them one at a time. So I'm going to go to, I'll just go to the Audubon Center first. A lot of us are familiar with that one before we get to the uh, hospitals because it's bigger. Say Navisworks files and let's go ahead and bring in the architectural model. Okay. You'll see they have a file format called NWC. That's a file format Navisworks cache that got exported from Reddit. So it has kind of the essential features, the essential information, but it doesn't have all the Revit information in it. But if you bring it on in, you'll see the model kind of shows up there, hanging in the middle of the screen. Okay, That is the same building model. We can zoom around. We can orbit. We can do a lot of the Revit sort of things that we're used to doing. Let me orbit around a little bit. Looks like, ah, let's play some games in terms of just navigating in here. This model is actually, ah, you have Mr. Avatar in there too. I, I got this under one. Oh, it just has to do with how the uh, model is set up right now. The, the model's kind of hanging out there, but you have a little ground plane, and you also have Mr. Avatar in terms of, you know, we can go ahead and turn him off. That's part of sort of the viewing properties. Okay, but so if this is the same model? Yeah. It is. It's just um, you just have background on it. There's this one. Uh, I, I, I have one option when I when I when I um, oh. attach from that. Just right. I have one option. To let Let's it. do this. Let's hit pen this and one one change it to the NWC format. Try that one. This one. Yeah. Because what you opened up is one that actually has everything all put together already. So how do I close this one? Uh, just say open this, and I think it'll close up that one too. True. It may not be true. Oh, well, how about this? Go there and just say, let's say delete that one. Yes. Mr. Avatar is still there. Nice. Let's go to, I think it's in the view menu. Okay, we're going to find uh, da, 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 view queue, display. I always have to find these things. Let's go to the viewpoint menu. I don't, I don't mind it. Oh, no worries. Now let's get them out of the way for now. There's a the realism. Turn off the third person. Okay. So now we're, we're sort of looking at them. Let's just kind of like, you know, different sort of things we can do in terms of navigating around. There's the whole roll in and roll out on your mouse button to kind of zoom in or zoom out. You can sort of orbit around. Orbiting's a little bit funny. Notice there's this pivot point kind of hanging around in there. And if the pivot point is a little odd, it's kind of big for the whole space, and you want to like recenter it. This is kind of a trick. It works within Revit too. If you choose the little navigation wheel right here, and you choose the center option, you can go ahead and drop the center of your world on some specific Revit element. And the big reason for doing that is it just makes the orbit a little bit easier. The idea is within Navisworks, and I know some of you played around with this when we were doing the uh, 4D simulation in A, is that you can go through and take a look at this tree and kind of turn on and turn off things based on the tree. So for example, if you take first floor and you click on that, you'll see those are all the elements that are on the first floor. If you go down to bearing, you can see things. Looks like the roof is considered to be part of that level. Looks like level 11, there's not a whole lot there. And there's some things that even have no level. 
but we have all this information and it all comes in if you sort of explore under first floor you'll see it's in there it's definitely in kind of what I'll consider a funny order what you have in there if you want to try clicking on any individual element is you can see here I have the exterior wood panel wall it's highlighting down there in blue we have some other exterior walls we have some interior panels it's just it's not in a lot of it's not in a great order which is one of the difficulties so we're going to learn how to kind of work with that. But you can go ahead and just choose anything you want to in there. And if you want to, for example, like say choose first floor, you can, if you right click on that, say that, oh, I want to either hide the first floor or I want to hide everything that's not the first floor. So that's kind of a nice feature. Hide unselected will basically strip away anything that's not in that, so you're only seeing the first floor stuff. So I can say hide unselected, and then you'll get this kind of uh, view of the building that's uh, a little bald on top. Now, what people like about Navisworks is you can t look at these models, you can pull all this information together, and you don't need the editing tool Revit. And Revit's a big tool, it's confusing to an awful lot of people, this is almost like when you give someone like an Adobe Acrobat Reader document, you can sort of see, you can look at things, you can start to understand some of the information, but you really can't go through and edit it. But you can definitely go through and sort of explore it in terms of understanding what's going on here. So it's a really good tool for being able to sort of explore and understand a model without having all the detail or even have the ability to go through and change things. If I want to share something with you and I don't want you to change it, I just want you to see it and give it to you as a Navisworks file. And so it's kind of useful in that sense. The other thing though that's really, really good about Navisworks is it understands and pulls together files in a lot of different formats. So you can take Revit files and AutoCAD files and Tecla files and ARCHICAD files and all these files, you know, even yeah, you, you may sort of see this on, on your site now, Andy, that like, uh, you know, for all the different subs who are supplying you all the drawings, like probably not everyone's working in the same tool. You have like 15 different tools that they've all put it together in. And Navisworks tries to be that unifier, just pull it all together. Okay, so Navisworks is really kind of good that way. The way Navisworks is, you can go ahead, kind of bring in the architectural model, that's kind of good. If I also want to see the structural model, I can say append and grab the structural NWC file and we'll put it right in there. Then we can start zooming on in. You'll see it shows up really as a separate model over here. If you only want to see the structural, you can say that I want to hide the architectural and only look at the structure. Or if you want to unhide that, you can kind of see them all together. But the idea is that there's a big value just to be able to sort of visually see these things. But then we'll also kind of look at how you can do clash detection and do things more programmatically to kind of find some of the issues or problems in terms of coordinating this. So Rami, related to sort of what we did in B, where this is really kind of useful is if you've done your structural model and you've done your MEP model and you've done your architectural model, this is a really good tool for saying, great, not only do we link them together, but can now I find all the interferences? Can I see anything that might be conflicting? Yeah, just kind of really check it out or even start doing an estimate out of it. So the idea is just to bring it together in kind of an easy use form. So, this is what Navisworks does. It kind of brings it all together, and then we'll kind of look at a lot of different tools for what happens after you bring it all together. But what I want to actually do is go back to Revit and talk about how you got here in the first place. Okay, so if I pop back over to Revit, and I'll open that up, and you say, let's go ahead and open up, oh, either the Audubon file, or if you're bored with Audubon, you can try opening up the hospital file, whatever you like. Let me go to, uh, let's see if I can get my folder here. Stanford, I gotta get my D up on the uh, bar over there. Tool, add current folder places, okay. So if I go for Audubon and I go to, for example, 
under Revit files and say the architectural file, open it on up. Okay, this should look like the standard Revit file. Take a look at that. So here we're fully ed editable. If you want to basically be able to transfer something like this over to Navisworks, what you gotta do is, there's actually this add-in. Again, the add-in, it'll exist if Navisworks has been installed on your machine. It might not exist if Navisworks hasn't been installed on your machine. Or depending on the order, it might not have made it in there. And, what's that? Okay, go ahead and start it back up. You'll see that under Revit's external tools, there's Navisworks and Navisworks Switchback. Those are two tools for working with it. What Navisworks 2020 does is it saves out as an NWC file so you can do the integration. Navisworks Switchback is actually kind of very cool. That's something that says if you have a problem that you found in Navisworks, you can go back to Revit, go to exactly the same location, make a change, and it will go back to Navisworks and take you to the same location so you can kind of confirm that things are fixed. So the, what we tend to do here is really just, from these different Revit models, say, export Navisworks. And when you say export Navisworks, you can say, let's create an NWC file and kind of adjust the settings. In general, the settings are pretty good. You don't have to really play around with that too much. There is something here about whether you want to convert leaked files. That's the whole notion that if you have an architectural file and there's already a linked structural file, do you want to also send the linked file or only sort of save the main one? So you know, typically, I leave that turned off because I want to send them independently and then kind of do the linking within Navisworks. Other kind of ones in here, we'll play around with a little bit. There's one called converting construction parts. I'll show you what parts is in just a second in terms of being able to kind of break things down into finer levels. What else is in here? There's a convert element, par element parameters all. That's typically the one if you've added some custom parameters, some additional data that's not typically part of the web database. You want to have that on, otherwise it won't get transferred. So let's cancel out of here and just talk about a couple of those things. So as you're transmitting this information, you're sending it on over there, here's the deal. If it's showing up in this window when you say transfer, it'll go. If it's not showing up in this window, it won't go. So if you have things turned off because visibility graphics are hiding them, or even if you have the section box set up in such a way that pieces of the model are missing, they won't go, they won't get transferred. So what I tend to like to do is actually come to a view like this that sort of has a little bit of everything in it. And actually, oh, my favorite thing to do is actually go through and let me see if I can find the default view over here. There's so, so many views in this one, it's hard to find anything. Oh, let me do this. I'll just say view. Default view. Where is it over here? What I really want to do is just duplicate this view. The 3D view has the funny brackets. There it is right down there. I'm going to sort of just duplicate this. What I'll typically do is just say, hey, let's go ahead and create a view where I'm going to call it like export to Navisworks. So I'll just rename that. And the reason I like that is just it sort of reminds me that I should always go to that view, which has everything turned on before I want to go ahead and send it over. So once we have that, we're pretty good in terms of sending things up. Let me show you just a little something about that parts, just because I sort of uh, kind of mentioned in the dialogue there about where that comes in. And let me even hide this for a second. Let me hide the roof. I'm going to talk about it. Oh, there's this little fascia. Let's get that hidden too. Here's the deal. You got that wall hanging around there. That wall is a perfectly fine wall. It's actually made up of a lot of layers. It's made of a structural layer. It's got some sheetrock. It's got some insulation. It's got some sort of side wall on the outside. That's pretty nice. The deal is, as designers in Revit, we like to think about that wall as being one big cohesive thing. 
as we start thinking about it more from a construction operation, though, it's like, hey, well, maybe it's not one cohesive thing, because some guy's going to go through and do all the structure, and someone's going to put the insulation in, and then someone's going to put the sheetrock on, and the outside. You actually sort of think of it as several different pieces. So that's what this construction parts thing is about. And as we start moving towards doing construction planning, we actually start breaking our Revit elements down into construction pieces that make a little more sense. So a very common thing to do that we often start out with is if we have a wall and as we plan it, we want to think about the siding being separate from the core, is we choose the wall and under the modify, there's something called creating parts. And what creating parts is all about is really just taking a wall or any multi-layer surface. It works for floors, it works for roofs, it works for ceilings, whatever you want. Just take that thing, and it's a little hard to see, but there are now actually several pieces to it. There's a face, there's a piece of sheathing in there, there's the outside or the core of the wall, there's a bunch of different little pieces to the whole thing. And if we have broken it down into parts, what will happen now is when we send it over to Navisworks, those will come as individual parts. So we can schedule them and quantify them and like a uh, 4D sequence them kind of independently. So parts is just like one of those funny little uh, concepts that actually comes in very handy. When we go through and we start transferring things over and being our construction plan, there's a lot of little adjustments we tend to do. There's all those things we didn't really pay attention to as we were designing it because it was quick to you may need to add a little bit of detail to kind of fix it. For example, like the floor slab. It probably is not going to be poured as one gigantic floor slab. We're breaking into four or five different sections. So the same sort of thing happens. You can go ahead and, oh, take some section like that. And if you really want to go through and you know, break that into parts that are ultimately going to be poured or something like that, you do the same sort of thing. I could say, let's make that into parts, okay, which doesn't look very different at this point. Okay, but now what I can start to do is I can start to say, let's divide the parts. And I can divide the parts into, oh, just different sections. So I'm going to have a section over there. And I'm going to have a section over here. It's a little off, but it'll work. Hang on. Let me try dividing that again. Did I get it far enough? Okay, and now you can actually see that this little piece of slab over here, see if I can get to it. I'm right on the line right there. There you go. That little piece is considered separate from the piece next to it, so we can schedule it all differently and stuff like that. A very common thing, actually, if you're dividing into parts is when you say divide into parts, you can do it by drawing, or you can actually do it by grid lines, which is a very common thing, because grid lines are often a way that we do all that stuff. Okay. In any case, you go through, you sort of say you have your model here already. That part's looking good. When you are ready to export it, let me go ahead and turn these things back on, just so that uh, nothing is hidden. Let me uh, unhide that element. For the roof. Let me also go ahead and see if I can get the fascia. Notice the furniture is hidden. It's all hidden just because of visibility graphics, but that's okay. I don't really want to take the furniture for the purpose of what we're doing here. Okay, you got that. If it's in the view, it's going to go over there. So I say, let us go ahead and add ins. Send it over to Navisworks. Super, that's all there is. We're going to go ahead and just save it somewhere in a nice convenient place you'll be able to find it. I'll just put it on my desktop for now. 
And you'll see it's going to go through and break it all down. There's 4,000 parts that are here. And then when we re-import this back in the Navis workflow, it'll come across. So we should now have something that we can kind of bring together. So it all starts with just exporting this stuff and exporting it really from any of the different versions, whether it's coming from Revit, you know, Navisworks opens up things like ISC files and ECMA file formats and DWG files automatically. But I especially kind of like to talk about just exporting it from Revit just because the import side doesn't seem to work reliably all the time. Every once in a while, this things are missing. Okay. So the idea is, if you bring them on in there and everything is looking good, you come back over to Navisworks. You have them hanging out there. Often they're in pretty good shape and things are actually looking very good. But it isn't always necessarily the case. Every once in a while when you bring things back together, like they don't actually end up in alignment with each other. And I think a lot of us, you know, we sort of experience this where based on a coordinate system, if they weren't quite right, you might have some trouble where things are just a little bit off. And let's talk just real briefly about how you go through and fix that. If you're trying to bring things together and they are not quite in alignment, the, what you typically have to do is as follows. You go ahead and choose one of the models and, oh, this always takes me a minute to find. I think it's under item tools. I'm going to find in here, not hiding it, it is, hang on here, not find the items, select the items, because we're doing all that. It's the part where we actually go moving it around, and let me see where I can find, oh, there's item tools over there. I wasn't looking at it. There we have, it's transforming. There's these tools, move, rotate, and scale, and those are useful to you every once in a while. And here's the issue. Yeah. If your model is separated like that, and you need to move it in there, you can go ahead and move things back together. So now we have the architecture, the structure, as though they came in in two different locations. Okay. So you can go back and kind of pull them together. Let me go ahead and say reset that to put them back together. Well, so much for my resetting of the transform. Let me go to the transform dialog. That's another way to look at it. It really kind of just shows us, oh, really what the transform is. You can sort of see I've moved this thing over close to 30 meters, minus 20, 30 that way. Let me go ahead and just put it back to zero, zero, zero. Oh, actually, that's no, the center of the transform. Hang on. I'm goofing on you there. Because that's just moving the center. I'm trying to think. Let me just undo it for now. Pop it back over. OK, let's see what's happening under the transform. What's the center of it right now? What time is that? Was that? It's actually sort of interesting. So if you choose a model. For example, the structural model, and you go to item tools. Navis works as well as like Revit's a little confusing in that, well, it can be confusing, in that if you choose something and there's a green tab that's not the one that's open, you know, it's hanging in the background. Okay, you can either choose an individual tool or choose that tool if you, it's kind of a hidden pull down menu, which brings up a dialogue that lets you kind of change everything. So let us just try something a little relatively simple that will be a little more controlled. For example, if we positionally, let's move uh, this thing like, oh, 30 meters in the x direction or something like that. You can go ahead and just type that on in there. OK, and it'll shift it off. We can go ahead and uh, put it back. All your boxes are locked? Let's see. Interesting. Let me 
interesting. So it's all, okay. let's try this. Let's go to the uh, selection tree. And you got that chosen. Okay, and then, interesting. No, say, say transform again. Yeah. Or under there, yeah, where you were underneath it. Why is that? That should not be locked. This is it? the, the Navis works. I don't want to import it from the Oh, that should be okay in terms of the NWC. That should be fine. anything wrong with this one. When I was in, in blue screen, I kind of missed a couple of steps. Oh, no, no worries. I, I think you're fine there in terms of what's going on. How about you, Ronnie? Are you able to kind of move it around at all? Um, I don't have the iTunes option. Oh, okay. Let's try this. Let's see. Go to the tree on the left. Okay, let's just choose, for example, a structure file. Oh, okay. okay, and now let's go and under item tool. Let's see, and then and we'll transform it. Yes. It's still locked. How did we lock it? You guys are not busy. So I can move it to the call and search. Cool. This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. in terms of why mm -hmm. is that? And if you so if we try to type in there at the normal, but it's yeah, slightly yeah, locked. Or is how do you respond to it? Go to structure. Let's try that one. Yeah. And now do the transform. Still locked. Let's get the music out. Yes. Ah, okay, no, I, I know what happened. You gotta first move first and then transform. Ah, so move first and then transform? Ah. Well, then it highlights that specific tool. Okay, wow. Yeah, one more. So 30 in the x axis, you said? Yeah. Okay. And then I hit the reset. Should take it back, but again, well, the question is whether reset. Oh, I see, that's why it's zero there, okay. It's like whether reset just sort of resets it to zero, resets yeah. the position scale back to the original values. That should actually take it back. Although, for me, it's not doing that, it's kind of leaving it right there. Yeah, in you got to do minus 30 to take it back. Yeah, but then you got to remember. Okay, and take it back over there. Okay, so you can play around like that. The deal is, though, this tends to be sort of, as you think about this, even if it's so rotated, you know, there's all these ways that theoretically this thing could be off. And that carries a real difficulty for you. So this actually gets to the importance of grids, because that's really how you can actually go back and try to coordinate things. If all these different models have a grid system, the nice thing is if you have grid lines like A, B, C, you can pull over and make sure that they line up in all the different models if you came out of separate from models. So grids are very, very useful for that. Otherwise, it does get to be very hard to go ahead and try and get these things calibrated. But you have to get them all kind of in the right X, Y, Z locations just to get going. Yeah, otherwise you're just really in trouble in terms of trying to like uh, get any sort of uh, coordination done. So the first thing is really just this whole notion, again, whether it's rotation, and you get something that's off like that, and you have to go ahead and rotate it back. The key is to always try to be able to figure out really what is the difference between the different models coming in. When we're working as a single kind of unit on a project, it's easy for us to keep our coordinates in coordination. You know, but when you bring in models from several different sub-consultants, they may come in like this. And the key is really how to figure out and measure really what it is that needs to kind of go back you know, to get them realigned. Okay. And it's definitely like one of the tricks. So that's where grid lines are so useful in terms of doing this. Actually, let's try this. Let's open up a different one that I think may even have the grid lines. These models that were created, the Audubon models don't really have the grid lines in them because they were kind of a uh, generation where we really didn't use that very much. Let's go ahead and like open up a different one in Navisworks and see if we can actually look at the grid lines. Go to, if you can, under data sets, oh, try, Try hospital, structural. Oh, 
I went to the hospital, which is a very Navis works uh, or Navis works. Just the Navis right. works file. Oh, I'm sorry. That's correct. Let's see. It's I went to the one that says. Did, did it start a new Navis works? It's when I said open it, it really opened a different one. Okay, okay. So I went to hospital. I went to is it Navis works? No, I went to Navis works files. But you're not pending it over the same drive. No. Right? You're getting a new one. I'm just doing a new one, so what I want to show is just the uh, issue of, like, if you do have grid lines, what they look like. So, in this model, which is a structural model, we're sort of actually looking at it, the way I opened it, I'm looking at it from underneath. I'm looking at the piers at the bottom there. But you can actually sort of see there's a whole series of different grid lines there. And when I'm looking at them from below, they're looking red. If I'm looking from above, I'm look, they're looking green. But that is really, that's useful when you want to go through and uh, just try and align some of the models. If you have grid lines, you can sort of pull them into alignment and use them to make sure everything is kind of like a truly in coordination. If you prefer, if you want to look at it in a top view, you can look at it in a top view like that. That sort of looks a little more familiar. Even under the view, oh, what else is kind of useful for you here? I'm trying to think, there's show grid or don't show grid. Which is under the view menu. Just kind of useful in terms of, again, being able to line things up from different sides. But it all just really starts with first just trying to bring all these things together. Okay. So in the example of the Navis works, or the, the Audubon one, I'll go back to there again for a second. There's more files to work with. Again, I'll say new, and I'll just append. Go back to the Audubon set. I'll get the uh, architectural, and I'll add the MEP or something like that into it. Okay. Even add the structural into it. The idea is as follows. After you've put all these files together, okay, and you've gone through all the work of getting them coordinated so that you know, we're all looking at the same pieces and they're in alignment, you'd love to be able to save this because once you go through and do all that work, you want to sort of keep that translation, keep that rotation, make sure that you're reapplying it. Even you know, if tomorrow Alejandro gives me a new version of the architectural file and I know his core, oh, come on in, that's fine. Yeah, his uh, core, come on in, you're fine. Go for it. Yeah. yeah, your coordinate system is just rotated and off from mine. The nice thing is I'd like to be able to save this information so tomorrow I don't have to keep on reapplying the same transform. And you can save all that. That's actually sort of what you want to do. We would like to take this integrated set of files and save them around as something that we can kind of reopen and we don't have to go back and reappend all the NWCs, just kind of bring them together. So I got these three different sets over here. When I want to save these, what I can do is go into the uh, file menu and say save. And there's really a two major choices you have to worry about here, or two big choices you can kind of think about. There are two file formats that Navisworks creates. One's called NWF, it's a file set, and the other one's called NWD, like a document. So, NWCs, those are the ones that come in. Okay? The difference between a file set and a D, a document, is a file set is really just a series of links to different files. So the nice thing is, is that if you change the file that I'm pointing to, it'll adapt and sort of give you the newest file. Okay? A file set is actually really small. It's a really teeny bit of information that says these are the different files, the paths to the files, what kind of translation. Or even if I've done some assignment to scheduling tasks, it keeps that information. But 
file sets, you need the original file so that you can point to it and bring it in. And it's still it's live. Okay. D is another format. D is a document. D is like a like an Adobe Reader document. Okay. And like Adobe Acrobat Reader, the good news is anyone can read it. There's nothing involved there, but you can't make any changes to it. It's pretty much you can't get back to the source documents. So when people give you files, watch out for whether when instead of giving you a Navisworks file, is it a D file or is it an F file? F will be live and updating. You can keep on changing things. D is it's a snapshot as of today, locked in time. So everything about that file, you know, if I give you a D, I give you everything, but you can't change anything. If I give you F, Okay, I have to be able to give you the files too, otherwise you're gonna get like pointers, but it's not actually gonna open anything. Okay, so just watch out for that little difference between the two. Generally, I tend to say things as files, file sets that are live, okay, as opposed to D. Yeah, D is when you wanna give it to someone and no changes, no whatever, it's just a snapshot as of today. If I wanted to just coordinate some work with you but not let you change anything, I'd give you a D file. So if you open the D file, then you can't change it into an F file, no. I suppose. No. So Andy, I think even what happened to you when you first got started is you open, there's a D version of it, and the guy is standing up. All these things are set up, super, but you can't change anything. Whereas the F file, the links, then I can, I can hide, I, I can do all so the changes. you want to keep on saving F until you have the final drawing? In, until, as long as... Long as well, forever. For, Everyone, everyone who wants to continue to be able to have it active should always have access to the F file. The, the D file is really, you, you send that to the person who I don't say you don't trust, but you, you want to give them a, a locked set. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a, they can look but can't touch. When you give them F, you're allowing them to change things. Okay, so just watch out for that in terms of two different formats. Okay, so you can save them. The good news is when you save it as that, it comes on back. So for example, let's just save it as an F set. I'm going to say, let's just save it as an Aviswork file set. Super, I'm going to put this on my desktop. I'm going to call this session one dot NWF. The nice thing is now tomorrow, or if I mail this to you and send you the files, whatever, we can now just go ahead and say, let's open from desktop, session one, won't look very dramatic. Let me do new first. <laughs> Open, session one, it'll come back in. So just saves you time. So all the work of, it's also good in that, you know, if you have different sets that you're coordinating and putting together for different purposes, maybe the structure MVP is one NWF set with the architectures out of it, Anything you choose to pull together. So you got to send the files individually and then the NWF file. Actually, you can sort of save it all, send it all together. It's really what's going to happen is. I mean, you can send them all together, but you got to attach the files. Yes. Yeah. And you've got to do that. It's not like say you have a bunch of files. It, there's no way that uh, Navis works. Just gathers them together. That's an interesting one. You sort of wanted to do that, don't you? You really sort of wanted to say, let's go ahead and export this in some way. Can you do that? It's epic, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's nothing where it's really, it's sending the whole set. That's interesting. That's, that would be a very useful tool in terms of what it is. Because even I think what's happening here is it's really depending upon those by file name. So as you know, wherever those files are located that I pulled together, if I move them around or change the names, it won't necessarily find them. Well, let's go ahead and try it. That's actually a really good question. Are they linked? They I, I think they're basically links. So let's try this. Let's so if, if you change the file, would it change the entire model? If you independently change the structure's file, would it automatically change the... Um, the the Namsworks file? Yeah. Only if you save it as another NWC. If the NWC file changes, then so, so, we so it is like lively links to the end of to the NWC. So let's have, even try that. Okay, let's try this. Let's say that. Okay, I'm going to close that on up. We're going to go back over here. I'm going to go to my session one folder. 
So hang on, see if I can find where my Stanford goodies are. What city is that? Is that a... I'm looking to see if there's any landmark. I don't know. This one I don't know where that is because it's not it's not Hong Kong. It's, these are almost all Asian cities. I don't see the Patronus Towers. I'm not sure what city that is. Any ideas? I don't know. Gandini is the man of the world. Dr. Gandini? No idea. I don't know about that one. Okay, let's go back over here. There it is. Navis Works Files. So I said Architectural Central Super. Let me call it just like version two. Okay. Ah, because the file it actually understands the files open in Navisworks. Let me close it in Navisworks, and then we'll change that name. Can you have multiple projects open in Navisworks at the same time? Multiple no, only time. only one project at a time. Which is like so. It's it's always one project at a time. Yeah, because when when I opened the hospital files, they made me close the other one. Oh, exactly. Okay, so now it's called V2. So let's go back to Navisworks and then like see what it actually does when it sort of uh, decides that it's not so happy. So I'll say open. I'll go back out to my file set again. Ah, so it says it can't resolve the reference. It seems to understand there's something called Audubon Center. It's gonna ask us now, go ahead and browse for it. So I can relink it to the same place. Okay, so I'll take it to V2, and that'll really take its place. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. Oh, how did you do that? Just like, I, just I, I, I I've been there, so I thought it was, but I didn't know. Is it this? Oh, that one. That's Sorry, it. I'm yeah. Looking for it, so. <laughs> Very good. We have better than image search. We have Alejandro. It's <laughs> like, okay. So in terms of like pulling these all together, saving and stuff like that, Navisworks is a really good for doing that. You know, what we'll play around with next time is really it's selecting and searching, and there's all sorts of things you can do within your actor. Let's just kind of give you a preview of that. It's really, you know, once you have this stuff set up, okay, and we're looking at it, and we have the model integrated and stuff like that. The biggie things people tend to do with this is you can hide and unhide different things. So I'll hide the structure. You know, I'll unhide the structure. I can highlight different things. There's all those things you can do. That's actually kind of useful. Another way of looking at it, though, that is really very useful is you can take this view and you can start section boxing it. And see how section boxes are really sort of cool for understanding how things interrelate. And again, if you didn't give oh, access to the models you know, back in Revit to do this, you can still get information out of the model that way. So we can go to the view tool, for example. Can, oh, let me find this, or it's viewpoint. I'm always bad about that. Okay, we can go through and start creating some sectioning. So within here is a couple things we can do. One thing that we even sort of played around in BIM 360 in like uh, uh, the B class was to be able to save different viewpoints. And in the same sense here, any sort of space that I sort of see, oh, let me go ahead and orbit this around a little bit. So this is a view. For whatever reason, I like this view. I want to save this view, share it with you, let you know what's going on. I can save the viewpoint. OK, give it a name over here. So great. This is the uh, front right. Not a very good name. I'll go ahead and orbit around. and choose some other view. So I'm over here. Great. I like this viewpoint. I'm going to save it. I'm going to call it front left. OK, viewpoints, again, very much like in BIM 360, are just save camera positions. So if I click on front right or I click on front left, you can start building up a whole library of different save viewpoints to help people just understand and navigate the model. So there's all sorts of different models in here. 
fact, there's even some saved models of uh, viewpoints. If you want to sort of explore some of them, go for it. You can go through and say, there's the ortho south. There's something about the interior hallway, the administrative exterior. Just all these different camera positions have been saved on the model. And those are really quick ways of navigating through the model. So the idea is you want to sort of build up all these saved viewpoints. Once you have the saved viewpoints, the idea is if you're from a viewpoint, if you want to turn on or turn off different things. For example, in this viewpoint, you see the structures here, you see the mechanicals here, I have the architectural here. Maybe in this viewpoint, it's a little confusing to see the architectural as well as the structural mechanical. If I really just want to focus on structural and mechanical, you can just hide the architectural. So I'll say, great, let's just go ahead and hide that. Okay and turn it off, and now I can sort of walk around and look at just the skeleton of the building. In terms of walking and things like that, there's sort of the orbiting that we've been doing. Another tool that's over here, they have a special tool down there that says walk, or you can do it using the kind of navigator you may be used to in Revit. Either way, but walking basically just takes you through. So you can walk and look and do whatever you want. You know, for every these different viewpoints, always controlling what is visible, what isn't visible, things like that. Okay. You could also go through and if you decide you want to create a little bit of an animation, you know, set up something called a walkthrough, which is just a path between several different cameras. Let's see if we can sort of make it play. It looks, it looks like it's not all there. We have it there. Eh, we'll play with that next time in terms of working on that. Let's go back over into the building. Okay, that whole thing, Andy, that happened to you where it was the guy standing up in the front. You can turn that on if you want to. That's third person. Is that for scale? Or? Yeah, it's just really just to give you a sense of scale. You can adjust these little avatars to sort of be more like you. So you can sort of see yeah, approximately where that is. Let me go ahead and unhide that. You can also, under the notion of realism, turn around the whole notion of whether you can turn on collisions. That is, like, if you bump into walls, you'll bump into walls. You won't go through walls versus walking through walls. Gravity is really, oh, it's that if they're like walking downstairs, you'll sort of, you know, your, your avatar will sort of move down. Crouching is like, oh, if you kind of walk up to something that would sort of be at your mid-level, can you crouch and go under it? Why did you press the walk aside? Oh, what I, I went through in 3D view, I just went to one of the ones that said interior. So interior classrooms or interior entry court, just to kind of get myself to a good viewpoint. Okay, and then once you're in the viewpoint, now you can choose the walk tool, which is over here. So we'll come zipping on in here. You can see things like lights floating up in space, which aren't very good. So <laughs> let me turn on the uh, collision, just because I want to sort of see the effect of if I go into the glass. It won't let me go through the glass. Let's see if it'll let me go through the door. I want to see if doors are special. No, still won't let me go through. So there's a way of quickly turning off collision. I got to think about what it is, whether it's, it's something weird, like holding on the space bar or something like that. But let's see if we can get anything on there. Control D turns collision on off. The, defect, the function defines blah, blah, blah. I know there's some shortcut. Well, 
We can go into it and control D it. I'm up against the door, so control D allows me to bust through. I can turn it back on again, so I'm not kind of running through things. So it's all about setting up these different sort of viewpoints and kind of being able to navigate around in there. The nice thing is, as you're working around the model, um, you can also interrogate the model. So as you're looking at the model, if there's anything that sort of catches your eye that you want to know more about, you can go to the Home tab and say Select and get information on, oh, that's this W18 by 24, or that is this HS66, or that is some type of a door panel that's over a 10 foot 6 opening. So you can interrogate everything. You get the properties of things, okay, which is actually kind of nice. Even here, there's this little selection <coughs> vector. As you go selecting different things, it'll kind of tell you what it is that you selected to give you a sense of that. What we're going to get into ultimately marking those things and saying, hey, you want to go through and change these things and go back to Revit. One last thing for today, and then we'll get out of here for today. It's as you're working around, I'm going to go to the outside and orbit it around. It's that sectioning thing. I started heading down this path, but didn't, got, sort of got waylaid along the way. Sectioning does this. It's really, it's like the section box. Walking through in a very uh, immersive way is kind of a really great way to experience the space. But if you want to think about it more in terms of, oh, just being able to cut through and see all the systems in place without hiding them, enabling sectioning lets you do that. And let's talk about that. There's really just this notion of there being different planes. And, oh, so under uh, viewpoints, say enable sectioning. So go to viewpoint, it should be over there. Okay. And if it's on, let's go over to our sectioning tools and see if we can sort of make this work. The idea is, oh, there's a, some sort of a section plane at work here. Although, from where I'm looking at right now, it's hard to see where that is. You can sort of see where it got cut. Let's see if I can kind of do a different alignment. Let me align this to the top. Say plane two, okay. That's aligning to the bottom. Let's see if I can push and pull this around and make it make sense. I'm still orbiting right now. Hang on. Escape out of there. Where am I? I'm in a very weird spot right now. Let's see if I can make sense of this again. Oh. Let me see if I can get back to this. Hang on. There's different planes being turned on. You could actually define different planes. What I want to see is actually just uh, the plane itself. So hang on. Let me go back to the outside again. Let's pan that up. Okay, turn on the sectioning. So. Here's the section plane. I want to get rid of that thing. It's usually Control W to get rid of that. I want to. I just close it up there. Okay. In terms of the plane, you can sort of see this is a vertical plane. I can kind of pull it back and forward. I can pull it over to the side. Well, actually, in this case, since it's a plane in this direction, it won't make much difference to pull it to the side. Let me switch it over so the alignment is a little bit different. That says alignment top, which sort of confuses me. Oh, well, that's yeah, still there. Okay, let's try a different plane. Okay, we now got plane two. In terms of what's going on with plane two, close 
close that up. I'm underneath it. There we go. So it looks like in terms of what's going on, what I'm saying by the alignment is, is this thing that I'm doing, this plane, is that the bottom or the top? And in this case, it's the bottom. Let's kind of changing that to plane two. Let's say, let's make it the top, at which point, okay, we'll be growing up that way. We're kind of oriented in sort of a funny way. But the idea is that as opposed to making, hiding everything, you know, you can use these planes to go through and kind of see and highlight and just try exploring different information, kind of quickly uh, just giving people a sense of really what's inside the building just by sectioning it through, okay? Which is actually kind of nice in terms of just really quickly uh, just being able to see how all the complex information really stacks together. In the same sense, we should be able to take any building and if we orient this plane, let me go to plane three instead, okay, which is there. Plane four is on the back side over there. But what's interesting as we do this, kind of pop back out there. that whole funny thing about being able to see the plane. Because I want to be able to see the plane. Well, I guess it's coming in. It's actually sort of very interesting about this whole notion of, you know, having the plane visible and actually shooting the plane. That's kind of very strange. Okay, but we'll work with it. If I want to rotate the plane, I can tilt it. You want to do it that way, or probably a better way. Let's think about it in a top view, just kind of rotating it around like that. So now I have this like a, you turn off the rotation, go back to moving the plane being able to cut through the building to see things like that. So next time, we will continue to play with all this stuff in terms of this working with that. What we're going to do is really say, hey, OK, it's great that we can get these models in here. That part's looking pretty good. It's good that we can go through and kind of turn things on and off and start sectioning things to sort of highlight different things. That's all looking pretty good. What we're going to do is get into you know, how to save those things, just kind of make little walkthrough animations as well as to say, you know, this thing over here, which is pretty ugly in terms of the standard selection tree for finding anything, you know, how can we put together different searches and criteria to make that a little more accessible so we can actually find things we want without just having to go padding through that whole tree? Because, you know, typically what you want to do, I want to select all the ductwork, or I want to select all the ductwork that's greater than 12 inches round, or I want to select all of, you know, different things that meet criteria. So the big game in working with Navisworks is really not only being able to kind of see it and visualize it, but being able to select more fluidly so that you're not just looking at a list of a uh, thousand things, but you can really quickly get down to the ones that you're interested in. Okay. That we want to tag or export do whatever we want to do. Okay. Cool. Okay. Let us break for tonight then and uh, just continue on Tuesday. Thank you. And always, how about this? Like in terms of between now and then, okay, you got some models. So, okay, we put them on the machines here. What's the best way to get things to you? Like, uh, do, you, do you have Dropbox or Box? Or what's the best way? So I can put all that stuff up, or I can put it up on the web just as a link for you to download it. Is, it, is a drive enough to bring out or a drive? Say what? It's a Google Drive. It's got 15 gigs, so it probably works if you have nothing else. Yeah, I, have, I have Google Drive. Yeah, okay, great. How about you, Romy? I have both. You have both? Just what's the, what's the best way to get files to you? Because I can certainly take this thing and it's in Dropbox. I'll forget, I can send out a link and you can download it, put it on your own PC, whatever you want. But it's just good to like, you know, just you know, give you models to play with. So you can just start, start messing around on your side, on your own side. Like what, so any preferences? Google Drive? 
Okay, Google Drive is real easy. Is that good for you, Alejandro? I think so. Okay, because yeah, you get like 25 gigs for free or something. There's, there's a lot. Of, it's 15. Is it 15? Yeah, maybe 25. It's it's really it's pretty fluid about what's going on. Let me see if anyone of mine. How much data do you manage? How much? Not terribly. Yeah. Not, not terabytes. Nah, we're not too bad. Between schoolwork and out of this work and consulting and all that. How, so how so much it's data? 15 gigs. No, it's it's well no it's the thing that I have takes us so much space. All these videos. The videos like are, how much did you say last time? Every more than one tower, right? Yes. Yeah, it's it's just because there's like you know is it, an five. is it an HD camera? No, it's even just you know that camera over there is oh. it's it's really it's well it's I guess no it is sort of HD it's sort of recording my screen full screen it just every session is like about three gigabytes or something like that it's just yeah it gets to be really really big when you the good thing is when you put it up on YouTube it really it strips it down and it becomes like a couple hundred k or a couple hundred megabytes it's much much better but yeah it's just a lot of data. So it looks like that has 15 gigs. So if I if I send you a link to link it that way, whatever. This yeah, I gave you a lot of models today. It was like 700 Actually, megabytes. For me, if you can can you continue to share it on the Google, on the Dropbox? Yeah. For me. Yes, yeah, so you're good that Dropbox way. Drops. You just leave it there. So so you yeah, you, you I'll have you, that session one, and then if you have yeah, something else, you, you just have my whole session folder. So, so or from the whole course folder. So I'll just. Oh yeah, that was the whole course. Oh, yeah. So as I give you session two, session three, I'll just keep on putting things in there. Okay. Okay, but not everyone has a lot of Dropbox space because you have to pay for it. Yeah. So if Google Drive works for you, I'll send you a link on Google. How, 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 how much, or how much, gigabytes, how many gigabytes does it come when you start the Dropbox? It starts with two gigabytes. For free? Yeah. And then you guys are paying? Yeah. So Google Drive is 15 for free? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to put the videos on YouTube or on the Dropbox? I put them on, I put them on YouTube. Okay, so yeah. I don't have to that, You don't have to worry about the videos. Okay. No, it's really just the data set. Yeah, so. no, but just in case I want to rewatch them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know exactly. I think especially as you get started, because yeah, this is newer for you. Yeah. You know, all this weird flying around on the screen and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, that'd be a little strange. Like, yeah, uh, actually for you, for 